Welcome to Ms. Franken's Flip Classroom. Today we're going to be talking about the Federalist Era and the creation of political parties. Washington as president is known as a trendsetter. He's the first president, so pretty much everything he does sets precedence. He's often referred to as the precedent president. He develops a cabinet, a series of advisors, He's a war hero. He leaves after two terms in office, and he maintains neutrality in foreign affairs. We'll follow these more often than not. The Judiciary Act of 1789 set up the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, and the federal courts. There were 13 districts set up, one for each state, three courts of appeal, and the Supreme Court, which had six members. John Jay was chosen as the first Chief Justice. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, devised an economic plan that Washington was very fond of. He borrowed money by issuing bonds. He adopted accepted all the debt of the Continental Congress, felt that reasonable debt was a blessing. It showed that you were responsible with your money. Focused on industry, not agriculture. And he set up protective tariffs to keep American products competitive on the market. And he chartered a bank of the United States. The first few things were fine, but when he chartered a bank of the United States, there was an uproar. And it came down to loose versus strict interpretation. Depending on your viewpoint, the United States Bank might be unconstitutional. If you were a strict interpretation follower, the government only has power listed in the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson followed strict interpretation. If you followed loose interpretation, you interpreted the Constitution broadly, relying on implied powers. Alexander Hamilton is a primary proponent of loose interpretation. Strict interpretation says the bank is unconstitutional because it doesn't specifically say charter a bank. Loose interpretation, using implied powers, lets a United States bank be okay. One of the first challenges the federal government faced was, a, was an episode called the Whiskey Rebellion. The federal government put an excise tax on whiskey this upset farmers using whiskey to pay for things. Who wants to pay any more taxes than they have to? The farmers would terrorize the tax collectors. So Washington leads federal troops to stop the rebellion. And what this does is proves that a strong government was necessary. First true challenge of the federal government. So two political factions begin to form, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists believe in a strong national government. They're a bit elitist. They support manufacturing and trade and the search for wealth and power. The artisans, merchants, bankers, eastern farmers, manufacturers all support Federalist viewpoints. They're located primarily in the Northeast. They're very pro-British. And they're led by Alexander Hamilton. Opposite side of the coin, ideologically speaking, are the Democratic Republicans. They believe that states' rights over national government, remember, Democratic Republicans are the people that put in the Bill of Rights, 
because they were worried that individual rights would be lost in the Constitution. They support an agrarian economy, agriculture over industry. Supporters are found primarily in the South and the West, which if you think about it, geographically speaking, the larger farms and plantations. They're against the United States Bank. They're very pro-French, and they're led by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Hamilton will clash repeatedly. are united under Little Turtle and armed by the, Brit the British. The British are very dissatisfied and want to make it difficult for the young United States. So finally the Indians are defeated at the Battle of Fallen Timbers and in the Treaty of Grenville they end up giving up all of Ohio which is a significant amount of land to give up. Washington, as he develops foreign policy, he recognizes that as a new nation, we're not fully ready to take on any outside issues. We need to be focused on ourselves. And so he issues the proclamation of neutrality to stay out of problems in France and Britain. It's so successful, it's used until the 20th century. Geographic isolation actually helps us. I mean, uh, an entire ocean separates us from Europe, so it's very easy for us to stay out of European affairs. The United States enters into several treaties during the Federalist era, some more successful than others. Jay's treaty is not a great treaty. Britain had been intercepting neutral ships and John Jay is sent to negotiate with the British to get them to stop. Britain claims the right to seize cargo going to France. It's ratified by Congress, but the Democratic Republicans don't support it. It prevents war with Britain for a while but it is a terrible treaty. Nothing is really gained for the United States by this treaty. On the other hand, Pinckney's treaty, Pinckney goes to Spain to negotiate rights to the Mississippi. He also gets access to New Orleans. Very good treaty. Spain gets the northern boundary of Florida. A win-win. The United States is very pleased. When Washington decides to leave office after two terms in 1796, he sets the two-term precedent, which will later become law. But for now, it's just a precedent. In his farewell address, he warns America against forming political parties, foreign alliances, and sectionalism, because even all the way back in 1796, the North and the South are developing some very significant divisive issues. John Adams follows him in office. He's a, he's a Federalist. He was the Vice President to Washington. His Vice President is Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But John Adams is not really suitable to be the vice president. He has a very paranoid personality, and that's going to come across in some of his policies. The XYZ affair, France is seizing U.S. ships. Adams sends Pickney to negotiate, because remember, he's very successful with the Spanish. The French send three people, known as X, Y, and Z, and essentially, the French say, if you want us to stop, 
you have to pay us bribes. And Adams, instead of saying, okay, we'll pay your bribes, forms a navy instead. And this is probably the most successful thing that he does during his term in office, creates the navy. America turns against the French, and that's going to last for a good period of time. Not everybody's happy with the Federalists in office. So, Adams passes what's known as the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. If you're an alien, the president could deport any immigrant who criticized the government in public. Sedition spoke to publicly criticizing the government becomes a crime for citizens. Well, this violates the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights. In response to that, Virginia and Kentucky pass what's known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolution. Democratic Republicans criticize the Alien and Sedition Act, call it unconstitutional, and the Virginia Resolution says the state government can declare federal law unconstitutional. Whoa. That's pretty big. Kentucky follows up and says states have the right to ignore or nullify federal law. This is the first time states try to override federal law. And here it is, 1798. We're a very young country, and it certainly won't be the last. So when we come back, we'll look into what happens next. Thanks. See you soon.